Galatians chapter 6, beginning at verse 6 today. Introduction, what kind of material do you put at the very end of a letter? What is your mood as you finish a letter? Especially one in which you have had to say some strong things. Well, today we listen as the Holy Spirit inspires one of his apostles to finish his important letter. Galatians chapter 6, verse 6, to get us off to a glorious start, a reader. Margaret wants to do it. Fine. Anyone who receives instruction in the Word must share all good things with his instructor. Simple enough. What does this mean? A uh, characteristic of the Christian faith is that it is passed from one person to the next. Through whom did the Holy Spirit teach the word of freedom to you? And then maybe what role have pastors and teachers played in your life? So, first question there. Who did the Holy Spirit use in your life? Parents. Mom and dad. Yeah. Most of us would agree. <coughs> Grandparents, anybody? Aunt or uncle? Yeah. I remember going to church with my grandparents. I thought it was really cool when I turned 16, I could drive them home from church. <laughs> That was always fun. They had a nice big Buick. It was a big boat. <laughs> and, uh, uh, never driving a more comfortable car. Uh, Joan. Uh, a couple people. Uh, Mrs. Schomburg, who I had in Sunday school, was my Sunday school teacher for in the last years so that I went to Sunday school. And her son was a pastor, Glenn Schomburg. Glenn Schomburg. And um, anyway, um, she was a good influence in it. Dr. Becker in college. Amen. That the, Amen. the only person who ever gave me a D. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I worked harder for him than anybody else. <laughs> I got it. Yeah. Wait. We both had the same teacher, different colleges. My grandmother, when I was little, would put out in the middle of the living room the little cushioned ottoman, I think they call it, have me stand on it with a Bible and pretend I was a preacher. Pastors <laughs> 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 or teachers that have played a role in your life? I, we've already had a couple examples. Yeah, well, I had a Sunday school teacher, I think, when I was in the second grade. Her name was Joan Getsky. And she made a remark. She says, you've got a good singing voice. You should pursue that, you know, in your later years. Well, I sang in the choir for 50 years. And I, I, a lot of credit goes to Joan Getsky. Yeah. Yeah. I you know, people ask me about my my story, you know, why did you become a pastor? And I I can't really point to a, a single pastor or teacher that really encouraged me specifically as much as lay people in my congregation encouraged me. Uh, that's that's not a knock against my pastors or teachers, but they probably saw me misbehave in class and uh, other people didn't. Uh, but, yeah, you know, not only does... Just pastors and teachers, but um, yeah, other people have encouraged or taught. So, Sunday school teachers, yeah, she's. I'm sure she's in heaven, but honored you. You know, she has still an impact on your life, uh, Margaret. This is a little different, but in my walk in life, it's been some very busy years with a lot of small children at once, and I can remember sitting in the middle of the playroom which would have been anybody else's dining room, but for us, the four babies were in there. Um, we had little visits with God, <coughs> children's devotion. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and at the end of the story, there's a short passage that 
I would say, and then each of the little ones would repeat. And my daughter, Naomi, looked up at me, looked around the room, and she said, serve the Lord with glad mess. <laughs> and I thought to myself many times afterwards, we don't have to just serve him in church where we're all cleaned up, but sometimes in the middle of a mess. Yeah. <clears throat> I had a pastor uh, in Michigan, uh, in Sutton's Bay, Michigan, and uh, he was uh, very adamant. He said, Al, you're not going to Michigan State, to which Wayne would probably <laughs> well, I agree with Michigan, you know. Uh, but anyways, he said, you're going to go to Bethany Lutheran College. And I said, well, where, where, where is that? You know? <laughs> and uh, He took you there. Yeah, he took me there. So, uh, and I met Gail, and the rest is history. You know? So Michigan State, will, I, I'll root for Wisconsin this weekend. Uh, so agree or disagree verse 6 is a suggestion not a commandment God share all good things with me he wants us to do it I think he wants us to do it with the Lord right Again, how do you find commandments, right? It's not a Ten Commandment or the Eleventh Commandment, but yeah, I I would disagree. It's definitely not a suggestion. Um, we share our faith with each other and and encourage one another. Uh, I, I I think the next point here in the box kind of <clears throat> illustrates why this is important. Uh, if a congregation is not sharing all good things with the instructor, what message does this send? Uh, what message does it send to the instructor, uh, to those instructed, and to the spirit whose work this is? I'll go with John just because I haven't heard his voice. <laughs> I would say to the instructor, um, they haven't been listening. Okay. They haven't been paying attention. So, and that's discouraging, perhaps, right? So, it doesn't seem like God's word is being imparted in a useful way that is reflected by the, those who are listening. <coughs> Uh, yeah. You don't want to discourage <laughs> pastors and teachers and your parents and grandparents. Um, if we don't, let's do the, the third one there. If we don't share good things with the instructor, uh, what does that say to the spirit? Yeah, Margaret? That we don't value his work and that we're not paying attention to his work in our hearts. If, if we're not responding, then we're not paying attention. <coughs> yeah, so... There's the passage, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Um, this is kind of what I, I think of part of it, part of that's talking about here. You know, hearing God's word, but you know, you're not growing in it, you're not excited about it, you're not talking about it, you're not asking questions about it. Um, if you're, you know, still living your life uh, according to the simple nature, you are Grieving the Holy Spirit, aren't you? You're <coughs> telling him he's not not getting anywhere. So, you know, again, comedy. I mean, I don't know if you know you have to instruct the instructor as members, you know. But you know, I think just just telling your pastor that, hey, I was in Galatians and I really appreciated this because I 
I think our church does a good job of that. Or, um, you know, this is a temptation I have, but I find these scriptures encouraging. Just, again, just talking about scripture with each other and, and so forth is, is good. You can, you can send me an email and, and say I appreciated Bible study. Not that I want you to send me an email today, but, uh, <laughs> you know, surprise me in six weeks and say I appreciated this one point, you know, and that, that encourages me more than you would know. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, what I, I was thinking because of the way it says it in the EHV is that the one who has taught the word share all good things with his teacher. I was thinking that it was that when you are taught that you should uh, give back to your teacher um, feedback that you appreciate it. And like the October is Pastor Appreciation Month. And you should tell, tell the pastor you appreciate his work. That's, that's the way I read it. Yeah, thank you. I was at the Grand Theater last night. Pastor Davison was one of the ushers. So he just started it was his first time. <laughs> I wanted to get out and do something different. So Did he's he? going to be awesome. helping at the Grand Theater for the show. Did he get you to the right seat? <laughs> yes, but I knew where I was going. I knew <laughs> I'm gonna, I think I've decided I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna be a vendor at the at the uh, Woodchucks Stadium when I retire. <laughs> I, I think I think I could I think I could serve up a mean hot dog in retirement. He said he decided he needed to go out and do something different. All right. <laughs> Well, all good things continue in the Word, so that's where we're going to go back to. Uh, but the next verse is 7 to 10. Anybody care to give that a reading? Adrian? Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. To be sure, whatever a man sows, he will also reap. Indeed, the one who sows for his own sinful flesh will reap, will reap destruction from the sinful flesh. But the one who sows for the Spirit will reap eternal <coughs> life from the Spirit. Let us not become weary of doing good, because at the appointed time we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who belong to the household of faith. All right. Yeah, I like how they translated that. The household of faith. Uh, NIV 84 would say family of believers. So... Probably a, probably a more literal translation from the EHV would be my guess. Well, question one. A person claims to have faith, attends church regularly, and even is active in his church. Yet that person secretly values the pleasure gained from pornography more than the blessings the Lord has given in the gospel. Why is mocking God a good way of describing what this person is doing? So, again, it said, do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. The editor thinks that this gentleman in pornography is mocking God. He probably doesn't think so, but how is he doing it? He's not walking the walk. When he's walking the talk, he's not listening to but it says, turn away from this path to destruction. And he's keeping on with it. All right, so I think part of mocking is, <coughs> is simply the thought of being really critical, right? Um, another way of thinking of this is he, he, he looks like he's living one life, but he's really living a different life, right? That's hypocrisy. God, you can't, you can't fool God with... My folks used to call it two-faced. Two-faced, right. And that's what hypocrite means, yeah, in Greek. It's, um, yeah, <coughs> the other thing, two-faced. Um, Naomi? Is it like saying, ha-ha, I know you want only good things for me, but you made me this way. Huh? 
<laughs> so that's kind of along the lines of the, another, the other answer I have. So there is hypocrisy here, but there's also, I found something better, right? And, and maybe that's, God promises good things and blessings, but I don't, I don't want God's blessings. I want these other simple blessings. You know, and maybe that's where the thought comes along. Well, this is this is the way you made me. I appreciate these things more. Um, I I could think of it. I could think of an example um, from my life where I had a I got a good good friend. He was a neighbor, and we'd invite him over for dinner, and he was you know seven eight eight years old, and the first question out of his mouth would be, I guess. What are we having for dinner <laughs> when I come over to your house? And of course, why did he ask that? I don't make the decision. Because <laughs> you make a decision, right? I don't like what you're having for dinner. So I'm not coming over. I'll just make my mom cook me something. Um, you eat dinner, and then we'll, then we'll figure stuff out. Maybe we'll get together and play some football or something. Um, I, I, I think of that when I think of this, and I think, well... This guy might be, is kind of doing the same thing, right? God gives you these blessings, and then you say, "Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to offer different things that I think are blessings, right?" And uh, so it it's, ties into that hypocritical nature, but also um, you're not being not being thankful for the gift of your spouse or the girlfriend or uh, the gift of you know chastity. Or the, the, the path of chastity, right? You're just not thankful for those things. So you're mocking God. Um, yeah. And quite dangerous to your soul as well, right? That's, that's something we, we spoke about, at length about earlier in the chapter. A any other comment or thought to this point? <coughs> sort of to my left. Uh, I was just thinking, um, you know, certainly it's, it's bad and it's a sin. But he's caught up in a sin. I would rather have him in a position, though, of being active in church than not active at all, because I think there's a better chance of his, his repentance. Uh, you know, maybe the right word will come one, one day. And he's, oh boy, this is really, I really, I really messed up. So uh, that just that that side of it is, he is a sinner. We all are sinners. He's caught up in a real bad situation, uh, but there is a chance for him to repent. Before he dies, <coughs> I, I like what you said. Wayne, did you have a thought similar, or what were we, what were you no. thinking? The Bible talks about keep in step with the Spirit. The Spirit's doing the walk. Mm -hmm. Keep the walk with the Spirit. You're not in step with it. You're missing steps. You're tripping. You're falling. And the other thought came to my mind. I'm from Michigan, so I'm a car guy totally. So if somebody's a car guy. And then you don't you don't keep your car in good shape or something, and then you say I'm a car guy totally. You're not. You're kidding yourself. And you're not kidding any other person either, especially God. I don't see you driving a sports car. Oh <laughs> well, yes, I am. <laughs> you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> Actually, I did have one, but the grandkids got it. Okay. <laughs> Did, did I see the Bond car drive past me like yesterday in Wausau? Did we see a, a silver car? It, it was like a, there's a purple. couple of Corvettes yeah. around. There's an Aston Martin in town. Maybe that's what it was. Yeah, that Aston Martin. Yeah. Like, wow. That's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, to, to your guys, to you guys' points, you know, I, I, I agree totally uh, that only, only the word's going to really work in this person's heart. Um, and you don't you don't want to take someone caught in a sin and be like, well, you can come back to church when yeah. your marriage is straightened out or your porn's gone or that temptation is gone. You know, <coughs> we we could go down the list, right? And then we'd find find our sin that <laughs> excludes us from being uh, a godly person. But <coughs> I guess the idea there is, yeah, what. You, you, 
you can have sins that you value, right? You can call them pet sins, maybe. But, but again, you know, are you struggling against them, right? You know, God, God sees the struggle, um, and hopefully, other people are are seeing those struggles too and helping you, type of thing. Right? Again, back back to what he said earlier: carry each other's burdens. Right? We talked about that. I was in chapter five: carry each other's burdens. Um, this 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 person doesn't seem to be having a burden in his mind, nor is he having someone to carry it with him. So, uh, two, what the the world may be fooled by the behavior of a hypocrite. That guy cannot be fooled. When will the truth become clear? Verse eight. Kind of stated in the positive. Yes, Denise. Was um, at the time of harvest, or what would be judgment day? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So I mean, you can, you can <coughs> fool fool me. You can fool others. You can't fool God. But. When it comes to whether you go to heaven or not, whether there's eternal life uh, being reaped on harvest day, uh, then it's going to be pretty obvious that you weren't you weren't loving, and serving, and obeying God above all things. So, yeah, and and, and again, you know, I. It's another kind of correlates with that whole passage of uh, about judgment, right? It's you know we're not to judge other people. I, I really see this as an application of that. So some sometimes and in some situations we cannot totally for sure say we know you're going to heaven or you're going to hell. We have their we go by their testimony. You know, if they were in church, they raised their kids, they took communion and read their Bible. I mean, there's all those things that, that tell us outwardly what their testimony is. Um, so we will we will have confidence that they're in heaven. But <clears throat> undoubtedly, I've buried people who are hypocrites that I'll be surprised that aren't in heaven. I, I, I totally expect not everybody that I thought was in heaven will be in heaven. And I, on the flip side, also expect to see people in heaven that will surprise me, right? It will surprise you too. Uh, the great thing about heaven is, of course, is you're not going to be up there upset that, you know, some people are in hell and not with you. You're, even, even if it's your, your best friend or your spouse, heaven is not a place of tears where you are sad like that. I mean, you'll know they're not in heaven, but you will not, you know, kick yourself in heaven because you did not do X, Y, and Z or something like that. You know, it's not like that. Anyway, thoughts, comments? Yeah. Well, the devil is like a roaring lion, and he sees people's weaknesses, and he tries to exploit them with people, and like... It's in the same category, pornography, as drug addiction, alcoholism. But a lot of people, like there's Alcoholics Anonymous, where a lot of people have had that problem. And yeah, I, and, and I, and I, I think the editor's kind of doing us a service a little bit, but maybe it should be stated. When he's saying, he's kind of linking hypocrisy to a sin. You know, and, and I think that's fair, right? We would, we would say, you know, at some point, every sin is a, a hypocrisy, whether it's, I don't believe in Jesus as my Savior, I believe in evolution, right? That's that's making myself an idol. Or if it's pornography, where, you know, I, I don't want to listen to God's word, I want to live a, a life apart from him and in the pleasures of this world. That becomes another idol or something, right? So, um at least that person that's in church 
is probably trying to fight his addiction. Well, we hope he is anyway. Although yeah, and that's motive, the thing too. We don't always know the always know flee, the motives, right? Flee temptation is maybe, what the Bible says. Maybe maybe he he's in uh, church because his his wonderful wife will not let him be anywhere else. Um, or maybe maybe he or she is selling insurance, and there's a lot of people at church, <laughs> and uh, they all need insurance, right? Um, he sells cars, and it's good to network in a big church for cars. Uh, yeah, his kids go to Sunday school, but he, he could, he could kind of care less his kids go to Sunday school as long as his wife's happy, right? Um, so, yeah, there. Again, we always have hope that the word is working through us, um, and uh, yeah. So, again, we're all hypocrites, right? We're all sinners and saints yes. struggling with our sins. Uh, but again, this this kind of goes to that whole point of really talking about unbelief, right? Really, you know, you're in this Galatian church, and that's. That's kind of, I mean, kind of what was what was the hypocrisy there? I mean, it was they were talking about circumcision, right? So if you were circumcised and you're going to heaven, and and Paul has to say, no, I mean, that's hypocritical. If you look to the, look to these laws and say that you're this is how you get saved, <coughs> you know, you're turning other people into hypocrites. Um, because they are not walking in line with God, but with their their own uh, Justification and righteousness. So, yeah, Joe. I'm sorry, yeah, Joe. Lois. I had someone who was an alcoholic who went through the whole program and said he did not drink for a while and then started drinking again. And what did he do? He blamed because of the wine he had at communion and started to become drunk. But that was his excuse. Yeah. I, I don't know. A pastor was mean to me when I was going through XYZ or my, you know, there's all sorts of excuses people can use. Um, cer certainly, certainly he was aware that he was taking wine when he took communion. So, I don't know. So, sounds like a finger pointer to me. Right? Um, Wayne? Well, we uh, used to speak of uh, sins of weakness and sins of intent, but even St. Paul said, man, even that I don't want to do it, but there I did it again. Yeah. So we're all doing that. Uh, yeah. And so at least he's in church, yes, but as far as this guy with no uh, blame in the communion wine, I mean, now they don't have that excuse because we have no alcohol wine. Right. It, I think it's a lot of it is the media, etc. If you're watching TV, cable, and they're throwing stuff in front of your eyes all the time. It might be drinking, it might be sex, it's always something. It might be something that irritates you and you lose your temper, that's another sin. I mean, uh, these uh, voting ads uh, <laughs> <laughs> can't break. <laughs> yeah. Only yeah. Only a month. <coughs> You know, I, I can't believe how many, how many, uh, it sounds like everybody's being raped and having babies right now, right? I just, it's frustrating. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, I mean, we, the world riles us up, doesn't it? And, um, yeah. Okay, I was also a news junkie. I've given them up. I read them now, and then I can flip through them rather sure. than watch them. Yeah. Uh, now, David Brinkley and Jed Huntley would roll in their graves with what's going on there. <laughs> you don't know who they are. So. <laughs> but, uh, the way we're going, the evening news is going to turn into TikTok in about 10 years. It's just crazy. This is dumb. Um, yeah. I think the pastor would, I mean, when he talks in verse 8, I mean, it's almost an analogy. If you sow good seed, your life you know that's what you're growing and, and your harvest is you know going to be good where if you're you put bad I mean the farmers you put bad stuff 
it's not going to grow. And that's just part of, you know, yeah. you aren't a good farmer, and, and there's a way of weeding out bad farmers real fast. So you're, you're laying the groundwork for how your life and how your soul is going to be tomorrow, right? And that, that's, that's, that's a great point there in, verse, in the verses he's making. You know, you've got to, got to be a little bit more long, longer-term thinking when it comes to spiritual things. Um, and, of course, sin is, I don't know, it's always, but a lot of sin is very short-term thinking. This feels good now. I don't want to be married to this person now. Uh, I want to steal money now. Um, there might be some longer-term goals in mind, right? But a, a lot of a lot of sin is is predicated on, you know, what's the, what's the shortcut to some pleasure or or some high that I can do now? And uh, maybe maybe I could write a paper on that someday, but. Um, Boy, if you if you can talk to and, and, and convince children and other adults to be more long-term thinkers, right? Um, yeah. Well, it's it's not going to be fun to leave leave my heterodox church now, right? I don't I don't I don't want to leave. Even though they're future false doctrine, I don't want to leave. But yeah, you're thinking short term. Right? You might need to think longer term. What does this mean for your kids and, and the next generations? Well, you know, do you do you, do you, want, do you want to leave your, your nest egg to this heterodox church that's just going to be further and further from the truth when you die? And you know, like I get it, I get it. We don't like to make hard decisions and and uh, and temptation is always to do the easy thing. But in the think temporally, but you gotta think longer term. Um, all right. Uh, question three. Uh, the following attitudes may make us weary of doing good. So just how each might be overcome. So, okay, the activity doesn't seem to make my life any better. All right, you leave up Bible study today, and you're like, I don't know if my life got really much better. <laughs> um, <coughs> maybe, maybe that happens. Uh, maybe, maybe you decorated a church and your back is sore. <laughs> uh, well, didn't make my life any better. What, what, how do you, how can you respond to that in a Christian way? How might that temptation be overcome? Margaret? Who are you doing it for? Are you doing it to improve yourself or are you doing it to give for others? All right. Maybe it wasn't. It wasn't about everything I got out of this experience, right? Um, maybe, maybe you decorated the church and then you got sick over Christmas and barely got to enjoy the decorations. <laughs> well, maybe it wasn't about you, right? It wasn't about. It, it was for others. Um, I, that's what I put down. I thought maybe like love for others, you know. I mean, Maybe maybe the Bible study had everything you already knew, and Pastor didn't. Pastor didn't really even dust off any good rocks for you to to, to gaze at and, and marvel at. Well, maybe you were here to encourage other people today in in ways you didn't know. Okay. Well, verse nine says, "Let us not be weary." And I do let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap the harvest. So maybe maybe my heavenly abode has a little bit more square footage now. Is that what you're saying? I jokingly say that, but we don't know. We don't know. I, I, I hope our I hope our heavenly homes are not, you know, communist, you know, shacks that all look the same. Uh, and and it does talk a little bit in the Bible about how in heaven there are rewards for, for service. So um, we're storing up treasures in heaven. Fair enough. Whatever those treasures look like, other people, um, you know, or just further blessings. Not too worried about it, because I serve I serve 
for the kingdom of Allah. Yeah, let me start. We tend to focus on physical comforts, but the Lord is totally focused on our spiritual welfare. Okay, so maybe just asking the question differently. So maybe instead of, you know, maybe, maybe I didn't solve a problem today like I wanted to, but the Lord has strengthened my faith for what it, what it needs to be strengthened for in the times ahead, right? So maybe if you, you came to church and you were hoping that uh, we were really going to tackle addiction and then pastor talks about education at the school, <laughs> uh, there's, there's a purpose for that. Uh, God will still use that even though we had nothing, nothing that really maybe applied to, you know, the drinking problem that you're, you're struggling with. So, that's okay. Uh, all right, I, I keep sowing, but there doesn't seem to be much of a harvest. Maybe, maybe as this is, we're, we're being kind and loving, we're sharing our faith, not much of a harvest. What do we say to ourselves? Go. Well, sometimes, like, what we're doing in the church or whatever it is, Maybe there's another way of doing things than what we, than the way we've been doing them. Like our outreach thing had the example of the paper clips that we were putting together. Okay, you can't spoil that for anybody. <laughs> outreach. Everyone outreach might come back. Uh, <laughs> but I think, okay, I, I like that thought of... And like sometimes we go through rigmarole to do from point A to point B when, hey, just plain do it, be done. <laughs> so if I'm getting weary, maybe I maybe I need to refocus my efforts in a different manner Yeah. to succeed. Like they say, thinking outside of the box. <laughs> I like that. Uh, I simply thought of like the fruit of the spirit, patience, right? Maybe... Maybe, of course, we live in that instant, you know, I invited them to church, but they didn't come, so, all right, I'm done. <laughs> uh, no, no, we, we need to have patience with people when uh, we're not necessarily seeing seeing people getting excited about faith or, or, or such, you know. Um, yeah, um, Parker? I often think about Augustine. Um, his mother prayed and prayed and prayed for him, and I'm sure she spoke to him and taught him, and he went his own willful way. And in the Bible it says, one may plant, another may water, but it's God that gives the harvest, so we don't always see the outcome. In Augustine's case, it was someone else who came and spoke to him, but he gave the credit to his mother's prayers. So she didn't see this all those years, just like I don't see the response in my children, but somebody else may come into their life and help them turn or help them see it. Um, it's in God's hands no matter what. Yeah, I like, you know, Augustine's Confessions talks about that quite quite a bit, right? His mother, and yeah, I'm glad you, you mentioned that. He gave his mother the credit in the end. Um, so, if you ever read the Confessions of St. Augustine, you that on your reading list. It's very, very good. I think it's like required reading by even pastors and teachers at MLC. So, all right, yes. I think of this one, you know, we share the word, but God does the conversion. We, you know, we just need to understand that, that the Lord says, you know, we keep sowing, but I don't see the harvest. The harvest doesn't up to us. That's up to Jesus. Yeah, I, you know, we're taking the harvest maybe a little literally here. I, oh. I think of like sharing Faith, I think that's fine, um, but we I would take it maybe both ways. You know, it could just be results, right? You know, uh, maybe, maybe we keep falling into that sin or, or struggling with that sin, and we we kind of thought it would be plucked up and, and over with by now. Um, so all, all all scriptural thoughts, and I'm and I'm sure Paul's thinking Paul's thinking the same way too. You know, I'm not. I'm not giving up on you, Galatians, <laughs> uh, and uh, I don't want you guys giving up either. 
I don't know, I kind of see this as his buy-in section. You know, I'm buying into you and, and working with you, sharing the gospel. I want you to buy in and work with each other. And um, not, not give up. Uh, okay, last one there, third one. I hoped life would be easier, but now I'm being persecuted. How might that be overcome? Yes. Well, first of all, Jesus and even Paul mentioned it will not be an easy life being out there working in his kingdom. There will be persecutions and troubles itself, but we have him to be with us, our refuge, our strength, to persevere and to leave everything in his hands and to his glory finally. You know. And again, it's not about us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, you perfectly described the word I was going to use was submission, right? Or you're being persecuted, the answer to it is submission. It's not, well, I gotta stop doing what I'm doing because this isn't fun anymore. Or, you know, I'm assuming we're doing the right thing at the right time, but when we suffer for that and for Christ's sake, then we, again, we would say, well, I, I should expect this because this is how they treated Christ, right? This is, this is what Jesus taught the disciples. I mean, this is how they if this is how they behave when the tree is green. What do you think is going to happen when the tree is dead? That was Jesus explaining to his disciples. I'm alive, and this is how they're treating me. When I'm gone, how do you think they're going to treat you? And uh, so the disciples are, are being taught submission there. You're going to have to accept that there'll be persecution, but not, but not give up. So. Um, Adrian had her hand up. I was gonna say, um, it also strengthens us. Uh, we can we can sit back in the Bible and look at you know all the instances where people were persecuted. And we're like, well, that's when God was strengthening them. But it's hard for us to see when we're being persecuted to see the outside. You know that couch potato quarterback or you know whatever your whatever your Monday morning quarterback. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> well, you can see it from the outside, but you can't see it for yourself, typically, like when you're going through a tough time or you're going through that, that type of persecution. Like you're, yeah, I, like you're pastors, really pastors, pastors and teachers, I mean, we all experience this at various levels, but, I mean, there is a point where you utterly hit the wall and you just feel like, I don't want to climb it anymore. And, and it's not necessarily like burnout or something, but it's... But you just reach reach a point where, boy, I, I just hope I don't have another conversation like this for a couple, three or four days. <laughs> like I'm, I'm kind of, you know, and um, it, but you have to remind yourself it's not that you're failing, right? It's not that you should never have these conversations again, whatever they may be. But you, um, you know, pick yourself up and, you know, and I appreciate it too what. When did Jesus recharge? I mean, Jesus, Jesus recharged in probably quiet times alone, after usually some very tiring episodes, um, and that's that's okay. But you can't. But Jesus never said, "Well, I I failed," or the disciples never said, "I failed in this city, so I'm not going to another city again." Right? Um, all Jews are the same, and all synagogues are the same, and they all they're all going to stone me. Right? You know, that's the devil. Tempting Paul to quit, but he's not going to. Uh, yeah, wait. Well, I'm going to say all these uh, situations are coming from a worldly sort of point of view, whereas the scriptures view is completely the opposite, which says uh, when you're when you're like Saint Paul in prison, then you're singing hymns of praise, and that's what stunned the jailer, and so you're being persecuted. Choice. Great is your reward in heaven. It's the world upside down, as Pastor Frostman's book said. Yeah. Uh, it's completely backwards to the world. What? Rejoice? We're being picked on? Persecuted? I was stoned. I was in prison. He says, well, on and on and on and on. I rejoice in my, that I could suffer for my Lord. Yeah, like a recent book would be, you know, Theology of the Cross by Deutschlander. Uh, an older book would be like The Imitation of Christ by uh, Thomas Aquinas. Um, a lot of the same thoughts, right? You, 
But at the same Don't time, up and, but at the same time, I could say that one of my calls for 15 that I was at a place for 15 years. There was many a night I walked down the alley behind the school on the way home and said, "Lord, how long?" So you have, still have your human feelings. Sure. <clears throat> um, well, the Galatians were loaded for loading themselves down with self-chosen laws. Paul says, "If you want to carry a burden." If you want to follow a law, let your burden be. Shared. Say again. Shared. Shared. I wasn't sure where they were going with this. That's back in the other chapter about carrying the other person's load. And yeah. So you kind of have to read between the lines because he's pulling it from verse 10 there. Like I said, sharing burdens be for the family of believers. That's what I got out of that. Okay. Yeah, so let us do good to all people. You know, so. He says especially it, to those. You know. Yeah, especially family of believers, right? So, um, <clears throat> so again, kind of the law of love. The, the law can be summarized in this way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. And you want to talk law? Paul is basically saying that in another way, isn't he? Not, not with these laws of men, but a law of, of love, doing good to others. And then Especially the family of believers. So I, I think this again goes back to the letter saying, Boy, I'm writing this to you mainly because you're infighting. I mean, and, and I, think you, I think you just do first things first. You know, I mean, you, you can take a congregation that has problems internally and problems in the community, and what do you have to address first, right? You have to address the problems in, in the church, right? We all hate each other, but we're really great with our neighbors. <laughs> We're not going to get too far, are we? You know, so I I don't necessarily hear him saying, you know, you should have favoritism, like, you know, believer in the church A needs twenty dollars and unbeliever B needs twenty dollars. Well, I always give to the believer, you know, and no, I but I I do hear him saying, you know, first things come first if. If you're not, your house isn't in order, then what good are you going to be to everybody else type of thing? So, uh, Paul, I think, again, it's being longer term here. You know, the arguments are a problem. The, 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 the false doctrine is a problem, but it's going to it's gonna escalate and get worse down the road if, if they're, the short-term things aren't addressed for the good of the church. So. Mm. So, if you agree or disagree, freedom in Christ does not release me from responsibility. Rather, it heightens my responsibility. Oh, please, Denise. I think you've got to kind of redefine the word responsibility. Um, and it's into... It's our job to spread the word and the gospel. Um, it's our responsibility to, to make sure that um, the people have the opportunity to come to God's faith, or to come to faith through God. Um, so if you look at you know responsibility as, as it's your job to spread the faith, then that's an agreement. Yeah. So I, I I guess I think of Paul's Paul's letter to the Corinthians, I believe it is, where he talks about treasures in jars of clay, right? We are jars of clay and we have the treasure of the gospel. Um, we need to protect it and share it and be good stewards of it. Um, so 
maybe you can think of money this way. You know, does, does money bring about responsibility? You bet it does, right? You have to be a good steward of it, or you'll you'll blow it, or, or it will pull you away from God, or someone will steal it, uh, trick you from it. Uh, could, could our faith in Christ be kind of the same way? We're not good stewards of our, of our relationship with Christ and heavenly things. There is a responsibility there. If, if you live your life thinking, well, I'm just here to make other people happy and have a good time, I mean, you just, I don't know, you're, you're, you're the equivalent of a homeless person walking around, right? You don't have you don't have treasure that you need to protect, you know, or, or to hand out. I mean, anybody can anybody can pick up the cans on the side of the road like you are. Um, but there's a responsibility uh, with, with money and a responsibility with tr spiritual treasures. Um, a, long, a long way of saying what probably you'll say very succinctly. Yes? Well... I agree that I think it depends on what you're calling responsibility. Again, our job is to be the witness, and God will take care of the results. So the final responsibility for another person's spiritual welfare, we're to witness to them in any way possible, but the outcome is in God's hands. And I'm thinking, again, of a close family member. but. We're not called to change their hearts. We don't have that power. Only God's word has that power. Yeah. I, th I think of the, the three stewards that were given, the, the minus, right? Ten minus, mm -hmm. five minus, and it was, it was the last one, three minus? One. One, one minus. Two. Yeah. And uh, I, take that very, I take that very spiritually. I think that's, you know, that is, that is not a, a stewardship Sunday uh, you know, we need to be given 10% or more type of lesson. I think that's a very spiritual thing. Um, you know, and of course, you know, going on that, that, that line, you put it on deposit with the, the bankers. The banker does all the work, right? <laughs> uh, you, don't, you don't really make loans and, and collect on loans. Uh, but... Again, you know, you're a steward of, of your financial minus. And, and you're, so you have the spirit working through what you deposit, what, what you keep lending out. Um, it's kind of my, my big thought there. Um, and so, again, yeah, you're not responsible for the results. I mean, you should beat yourself up whether someone's still a hypocrite or they're in, they're, you're sure they're going to heaven or you're not sure. Uh, you, your responsibility is, is the steward. And uh, so when the Lord returns, he sees that you have been responsible. See how I tied it all back together? Yeah. So, anyway. I think of the Fanskis that, um, well, Mary's a member now and her son. But remember their, her father-in-law? He used to come to church with a suit and tennis shoes. And, but he was a faithful guy. And he read his Bible at home. And his son at that time never came to church. And Mary either. They didn't come to church. And their family was growing up. But he made a big impression on his son, obviously. Because after he died, all at once they started coming to church. And he got active in church. And he... So, Mr. Fenske... He was sowing the word, and he didn't see any results except when he looked down. Now, he's not looking down. <laughs> well, when he when he will look around in heaven. Yeah. Point well taken, though. All right. Well, I'm going to read this section once again as a, a final summary. Um, next next week we will conclude Galatians. <laughs> Um, and we have some other references to look up to. So we'll be in Romans a little bit, and it looks like Jeremiah. So that'll be exciting. Um, and then, then, then the Spirit has moved me to to say in two weeks we will be studying John's Gospel. So the plan is to go through. Probably we'll go through probably. It'll be two chunks, right? So the first half of John's Gospel is 
uh, Jesus' ministry. And then the second half, which maybe will coincide a little bit, will be Jesus' trial and, and death and resurrection. So um, I'll give you those materials, Lord willing, next week. And uh, again, final, final reading here, Galatians 6, uh, 5, to, 5 to 10, or no, 6, 6 to 10, thank you, yes. Anyone who receives instruction in the word must share all good things with his instructor. Do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows, the one who sows to please the sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. God's blessings for the rest of your day. Thank you. I have no other announcements. Thank you.